Murderer by Joseph Scholar, read by Andrew Sachs. We rarely encounter hatred. We say that we hate parsnips or we hate washing up. But real hatred, that hatred which, like some malignant infection, enters one's being, destroying love, kindness, sympathy, care, understanding, generosity, every benign emotion, and then attacks reason itself, that is a terrible thing. And that is what George knowingly and willingly cultivated. His dull, lifeless marriage had long since lost such ardour as it had ever had. Mrs. George, as he called her, cooked for him, did his washing, kept the house clean. She received her housekeeping money each Friday and occasional cash for her other needs, tickets for the theatre with Mrs. McCurdle, a summer coat, a winter coat, whatever. Not every man is so well blessed. But George couldn't see it that way. He could have done what other men did, gone to football, watched the telly, dropped off to sleep, lifted his elbow at the king's head more often, even had a bit on the side with a complacent barmaid. He could have counted his blessings, but he didn't. He could even have taken a look at that old wedding photograph and asked how that fresh, smiling, happy young girl had turned into Mrs. George and if his own indifference had anything to do with the change. George did none of these things. He was a man who cherished a grievance until it turned to hatred, by which time he had but one object in life, to get rid of Mrs. George without being found out. He pondered and pondered, took his time, living only for the day. But how? One thing was clear. Poisoning and burial in the back garden was asking for trouble. Better a blow from a blunt instrument on a dark night in a strange place. But exactly how and where? Then he had an idea. Three or four times a year, Mrs. George visited her sister. And three or four times a year, George went travelling. Here was his alibi. When she was killed in Essex... He would be miles away in Hertfordshire. With the right route and roads fairly free of traffic, it would not be difficult to nip across and do the deed without exciting suspicion. That was the where, uh, but the how. No problem, when he came to think of it. The sister lived in a quiet little town on the Thames estuary. Just beyond the town was a pretty little walk, and Mrs. George, a great believer in a breath of fresh air before retiring, never missed it. Her sister stayed in to watch telly. The more George thought about the plan, the better he liked it. And so George waited until a month later, when Mrs George went visiting and he went travelling. On the second night he moved. All systems at go, he crouched in a clump of bushes with his blunt instrument at the ready. But no Mrs George. He shrugged his shoulders and hurried back to the inn. He had one bit of luck. As he tiptoed up the stairs, he ran into the landlord who was making for the bathroom. The landlord gave him a knowing wink and said, <laughs> Which one? That widow over at Elmcombe? <laughs> George looked shocked and said, Please, a choir practice overran. <laughs> it always does when one of my regulars wants a front door key. <laughs> he had strengthened his alibi. The landlord would never suspect him. The failure of his first attempt was neither here nor there. Here's to the next time. We may wonder if Mrs. George had suspicions. Never a conversationalist, he was now noticeably withdrawn. He no longer bothered to complain when his blue shirt was not washed. And one night, as she sat by the fire with her needlework, she saw him looking at her. It wasn't a pleasant look. And when he saw that she was watching him, he hastily returned to his newspaper. None of this escaped Mrs. George. She was no fool. Was she wise to his game, prepared, ready, waiting to use her rolling pin if the need arose? He had his second chance two months later. It was a nasty night, tense with fear, 
He shivered as the fine rain systematically wetted him, fearful that an involuntary sneeze would spoil everything. But again she didn't turn up. It was frustrating, but he had a plan, a foolproof one, and he wouldn't change it. He must bide his time. Four months later he set out on the now familiar journey. Once again he was in position, just off the footpath, hidden in a clump of bushes. The minutes ticked by. His pulse was racing, his heart beating like the thudding of a steam hammer. Would she arrive? Would she arrive? Could he finish her off this time once and for all? Scarcely daring to breathe, he strained to hear her footsteps. He tensed at a sound. Was it? Was it? Yeah, it was. You can always tell a person by the walk. And this was she, the sharp clip of her heels and the curious rhythm of her pompous strut. But there was a snag. She was coming from the wrong direction. He was positioned in the bushes with his back to her. He daren't move. If he so much as rustled the bushes, she'd run away, screaming at the top of her voice. He took a grip of himself, not to panic. It'd be all right. Immobile, yet ready to spring, he crouched in the bushes for the kill. He could now see her out of the corner of his eye. She was looking the other way. There was no mistaking her. The stocky, dumpy figure, the dowdy clothes, the antique hat. All his hatred welled up in him as he leapt forward and hit her. As she staggered, he gave her a push. And the next moment she was in the river. He closed his eyes. He dared not look on her face. He couldn't bear to see her lying on the water, her vacant eyes staring at him, accusing him. When he opened his eyes, she was gone to the bottom of the river, lying in the mud. But in his imagination he could see her face, a stark face with cold, staring eyes, a face from the grave. He squared his shoulders, put his blunt instrument back in its plastic bag and made for his car. He drove back like a man in a dream. Sleep came quickly. He was tired and exhausted. But it wasn't refreshing sleep. On and off he twisted and turned, troubled with vague dreams. At four o'clock he awoke with a start, sweating, trembling, crazed with fear. <sighs> He'd had a terrible dream. He had dreamt that he had killed his wife with a blunt instrument. He saw himself push her into a river. He saw the terrible look on her face as slowly she disappeared. And then he sprang out of bed in a panic. It wasn't a dream. He had killed her. He had killed his wife. His foolproof plan had a fatal defect. The killing was easy. He wasn't going to get found out. But the plan didn't allow for living with himself after he'd done the deed. He started to dress, but checked himself. He couldn't go out at this time of night. It would create suspicion. He couldn't even pace about his room. That might create suspicion. For the next three hours, his room was a prison cell. It suddenly dawned on him that he'd built a prison cell of his own, in his mind, and there might be no getting out of that one till the day he died. He did manage to get a couple of hours real sleep, and appeared at breakfast, outwardly bright and smiling, paid his bill, and went on his way. He couldn't resist looking in the boot of his car, but his blunt instrument was there all right. It wasn't part of a dream. Work occupied his mind during the day, but he had to face reality when he got home. His plan wasn't as safe as it had seemed. He had lost his work's identification label with his photograph and his name on it. Where had he lost it? Had it fallen out of his pocket by the river bank? If so, they couldn't miss it when they dragged the river, and that would demolish his alibi. Would he get away with it? And if not, what? Ten years? Twenty years? But he had a more immediate problem. Loving husbands ring their absent wives every night. He hadn't. Why hadn't he? And when she didn't come back, her sister should have phoned and told him. Why hadn't she? Was something going on he didn't know about? And Mrs. McCurdle? How long before she asked questions? But he was missing the biggest mystery of all. 
Why wasn't the murder on the news? Plastered over all the evening papers. And why weren't the reporters and the television cameras besieging the house, uh, demanding interviews? Something was wrong. He was in trouble. Any action might make matters worse. He could only sit tight. And still he pondered. The sister must know that Mrs. George had disappeared. Why the silence? Why hadn't she gone to the police? Why weren't the police dragging the river? She must have a reason for concealing the death. He would call her bluff. And certainly he picked up the phone. If the sister answered, he could still slam down the receiver. But the sister didn't answer. He'd got the right number, but not the sister. The house had been sold three months ago, and the new owner had just moved in. No, only one lady had moved out, the old owner, and she and her sister had bought a boarding house in Devon. At that point the woman became suspicious and cut off. Mystery on mystery. It had taken three months to sell the house, so Mrs. George knew about it. But did she ever get to Devon? Had the sister been by the river behind him when the murder was committed. Had she profited from Mrs. George's death by taking over the boarding house for her own? The days went by, and his questions remained unanswered. But when that gossiping busybody Mrs. McCurdle knocked on his door, he told her, I'm sorry, my wife has gone away. She's um, left me. It took the wind out of her sails, so clearly she knew nothing of the boarding house in Devon. But that didn't stop her making a mystery of his wife's disappearance, and when facts failed her, she drew on her imagination. She called attention to Mrs. George's disappearance and told the police that, in her view, her mortal remains would be found in the garden. The inspector sighed. Mortal remains found in gardens were the flavour of the month these days, and a stiff spell of digging might reveal no more than the remains of a ginger tom who died of natural causes. But Mrs. McCurdle's views, now common knowledge, sent George into vertical takeoff. He knew that mortal remains in gardens are two a penny these days. No self-respecting garden lacks a good corpse. And there might be one in his garden, put there by a former resident. He didn't mind serving ten years for the murder of Mrs. George, but what irony if he went to jail for an entirely different murder. But they didn't start digging. They had nothing to go on. Half-hearted inquiries dragged on for month after month, but though the police once questioned George, they never took him in. Thus it became apparent they were going to get nowhere. George began to shed his despondency. The murder was all in the past, and he was off the hook. Then assurance became doubly certain. He found his work's identification label behind the cushion in his armchair. And that was that. He was all right. It was a short step from there to believe what he wanted to believe, that he hadn't killed anyone. He examined his blunt instrument still in the garage. There was no blood on it, so he couldn't have used it. He'd chop it up and put it on a bonfire next Saturday. Granted, he had, under intense provocation, taken an extreme view of Mrs. George's conduct towards him, but kill her? Well, certainly not. No, it was all a bad dream. He soon got back into the swing of life. He resumed his visits to the King's Head, where the barmaid smiled on him once more. He engaged a lady to sweep and clean and wash up twice a week and leave a juicy joint roasting in the oven. Life was good. It took on a new vibrant dimension. He was living as he had always wanted to live. Until that letter arrived. It was a Friday. The toils of the week were over. The house was spick and span, and the smell of his cleaning lady's cooking was getting his digestive juices working. He shed his car coat, poured himself a glass of sherry, and settled down to glance through the post. A couple of circulars, a bill, a charitable appeal, a card with a dental appointment, and then... and then an official-looking letter postmarked Taunton. He didn't like the look of it one bit, the less so when he opened it. It was a letter from a solicitor, short and to the point, saying that his client... Mrs. George wanted a divorce as soon as possible. Had George been reasonable, had he stopped to think, he would have agreed like a shot and his troubles would have been over. He hadn't killed Mrs. George, and everything pointed to the fact that the person he had killed was a lonely old woman in whose empty flat, even 
Now there was a pile of final rent notices on the doormat, a pile that would grow for perhaps another two years before the landlords finally broke in and concluded that she had long since done a moonlight flit. But that hatred which had landed George in so much trouble was still with him and wouldn't let him go. So Mrs George was alive. She had gone with her sister to run the boarding house. They'd contrived to let him think her dead, and now she'd returned from the dead to vex him once more. How he wished it was her he had finished off that time with his blunt instrument. More than that, she had opened up another worry. If he hadn't killed Mrs. George, and he hadn't killed her sister, who had he killed? Some harmless, lonely old soul whose death had passed unnoticed. Perhaps with cynical scorn they had stood on the footpath and seen it all happen even rejoicing that what he had done would haunt and taunt him when he found a happiness he never knew before. He leapt from his chair, and leaving his sherry and the waiting meal, charged hatless and coatless into the night. He walked and walked and walked, rapidly and without purpose, until sheer physical exhaustion slowed him down. Only then was he aware of the world around him. He stopped and looked. He was on the Albert Embankment. He leant against the parapet and gazed at the river, it was high tide, the river was silky in the moonlight and flowing rapidly to the sea. It fascinated him. The water that was coursing before his eyes was hurrying to that spot by the footpath where the remains of the unknown, forgotten woman was embedded in the mud. For the first time he felt something which might have been remorse and even compassion. But he had no kind thoughts for that arch-tormentor Mrs. George, Conflicting emotions engulfed him as he gazed at the swift-flowing stream. He faced the ugliness of his situation and pondered on a solution. Should he leap over the parapet and join the woman he had treated so badly, his own executioner? If he did that, he would relieve Mrs. George of the need of a divorce. If he floated out to sea, never to be seen again, she would face the long-drawn-out business of getting presumption of his death. Would suspicion even be cast on her? Either way, Mrs. George would destroy the compassion which was prompting him to jump. As he stands there, torn by conflicting desires and emotions, a cloud hides the moon, and a mist from the sea blots out what little can be seen of this tragic figure. Heaven help him. Finished Business by Harriet Longdale, read by Haley Mills. The telephone by her bedside rang once, then went quiet. Then it rang again. Natalie Sims glanced at her wristwatch before rinsing her mouth and replacing her toothbrush in its mug. Then she glanced at herself in the bathroom mirror patted her face dry with one of the fluffy pink face towels her nan had given her on her 19th birthday two weeks ago and padded towards her small bedroom to answer the telephone. I wonder who in Hades would be ringing me at this time of night, she muttered to herself as she threw the towel down on the foot of her bed and reached for the telephone. Hello, she whispered into the mouthpiece, hiding her mild irritation. Could it be that bearded computer engineer who flirted with her so outrageously in the office yesterday morning? Certainly not. Where would he get a new number from? Hello? She said again when nobody responded. She waited. Then she suddenly felt vaguely uneasy. Even afraid. She'd never really liked telephones. They always seemed to represent some unseen threat. Ever since her mother died and she was told by telephone while on holiday in Florida. Is anybody there? she asked bravely. But her voice had become slightly hoarse. You're Natalie Sims, aren't you? She bit her bottom lip and looked around the room. But she was very much alone. She'd only moved into this small apartment that early morning. It was to be her first true home. A place of her own after all the years living with her father ever since her mother passed away. Her dad was none too keen on the idea of his only daughter living by herself. She had decided the time had come for her to prove her emotional and financial independence. Uh, uh, who, who wishes to know? 
Who wishes to speak to her? Who... who is it? She managed to say, although her throat felt constricted. Her knees felt weak, and she had to sit down on the bed. Does it matter? I know you're alone, but don't be afraid. It won't make matters any easier if you're afraid. You don't know me, but I know you. You live on the third floor of the building, flat number 37, and you have red curtains and a white ceiling with no shade on the centre light. You've just moved in, haven't you? I could help you with the decoration, Natalie. I could put up some shelving for you. I'm good with a hammer and a chisel. I have strong hands. Are you there, Natalie? Are you listening to me? Her mouth had gone dry and she tried to swallow but couldn't. Tears welled up in her eyes. She was truly afraid now. But also brave. Look, she managed to speak after a few efforts when no voice would come. I don't know who you are and I don't care. I can report this to the police and they can track down this call with ease. Stop this, do you hear me? Don't call again. She slammed the receiver back onto its cradle and covered her face with her hands. Her entire body was shaking. Then she collected herself and got up from the bed, rushed to her small sitting room, pulled the new red velvet curtains shut and switched off the naked overhead light. She stumbled back to the bedroom, stopped in her tracks and returned to the as yet uncarpeted sitting room and headed for her front door and checked the rather flimsy lock. On her way back to her bathroom in order to dry her hair properly, the telephone rang again. Her body went rigid. Should she lift the receiver or just let it ring? She decided to steel herself against that hateful, intrusive sound and entered the bathroom where she splashed her face with cold water. Then she remembered that she'd left her towel on the bed. The telephone was still ringing. Now anger got hold of her. How dare a stranger invade her privacy like this? Without further hesitation, she ran to the bed and picked up the receiver. Look, I'm going to call the police if you don't, if you... It won't do much good, Natalie. I'm in a public phone booth just across the street from you. They'll take their time as usual, and by then we can be good friends, if you'll only have the good sense to invite me up. By the way, I saw you at your sitting room window a minute ago. Why did you have to close them? You look real good to me. Natalie realised for the first time that she wasn't wearing anything. She reached for the towel and covered herself as she glanced towards her bedroom window. Thankfully, the curtain was drawn. You... You should be ashamed of yourself, whoever you are, she cried into the mouthpiece. Why can't you leave me alone? <laughs> we have a little bit of business to settle first, Natalie. You owe me something. What do you mean I... Who are you, anyway? How come you know my name, my address? Natalie heard herself saying. She couldn't help herself. She still experienced a feeling of outrage, of her privacy being invaded by a complete stranger. It was not a comforting feeling. Then she collected herself. It would be better and more sensible if she kept calm and... Or better still, she would just replace the receiver and refuse to answer the telephone if he should ring again. Then she could call her father and ask him to come over and collect her. No, that wouldn't do either. It would be an admission that she could not cope living on her own, and that not even after one night away from the family home and Dad's smothering protection. Natalie, be sensible. I want to see you. I must see you. The voice broke through her tangled thoughts. Look, whoever you are, if you don't stop pestering me like this, I'll call the police. I'm going to do it now. She slammed the receiver down onto its cradle. She was shivering, despite the warmth of the small room. Then she jumped up from the bed, switched off her bedside light and rushed over to the window. She pulled the curtain aside and peered down into the street. She could see the public telephone booth, the diffused light inside, and the dark figure moving away from it towards her building. She dropped the curtain and switched on the bedside light, then hurriedly found her telephone address book and flicked through the pages. Finally, she found what she was looking for.
the number of the local police station. She took a deep breath, then she dialed the number. In what area are you? She replied to all the questions and then tried to explain her situation as best she could. We understand your dilemma, Miss Sims, the police officer on duty explained patiently and rather condescendingly. But unless this caller of yours actually does something criminal, we can't do anything about it. She explained that she just moved in to the new flat that very morning and that this was the first time the calls had been coming. The officer was still non-committal and urged her to report again should the mysterious caller persist in causing a problem. Then he bade her good night. She dropped the receiver in its cradle. The silence in the building around her became oppressive. If only she had neighbours. But it was a newly erected building and she was the first tenant to take possession. The only one. She sat rigidly on the bed and waited. The silence around her became a threat in itself. She leant over and switched on a bedside radio. She took a sip of water, put on her filmy and silky new pyjamas and climbed into bed. She tried to read one of her magazines, but then realised she could not concentrate. She put it aside and switched off the light. Who could have made those calls? Somebody she knew. It had to be. He knew her name, her address, even her telephone number. One of her male friends, perhaps. She laughed to herself despite her unease. Male friends, indeed. Her possessive dad, bless him, saw to it that she, Natalie Sims, had never even had what one could call a steady boyfriend. That was another reason why she had to leave the family nest. Too much control. Too much questioning from her dear, caring dad. Sometimes his caring had become oppressive. That is why she had to make a statement of her own. And that is why she could not bring herself to call him at this moment. Maybe tomorrow. Suddenly her thoughts veered towards that bearded computer engineer again. The way he looked at her. It was what she would call a funny look. A kind of knowing look. And when he smiled at her, she wanted to respond but just for a fraction of a second. There was something about that smile she didn't like. She couldn't explain, not even to herself, why she felt it to be a bit creepy, a bit too intimate. She didn't quite know how to react. Eventually he shut his sleek, slim instrument case and departed, but not before he'd given her one more glance. I think he likes you giggled Nancy Smith, the girl beside her in the typing pool. Why he couldn't take his eyes off you? Oh, don't be silly, Natalie replied. Who is he, by the way? Does he work here? Hard luck, Nat, Nancy replied. He is from the computer maintenance company and they always send somebody new. A different fella each time. You will probably never see him again. An ambulance screamed by in the street, three floors below and recall Natalie from her reverie. Damn, she was nearly asleep. Such disturbing sounds at night were few and far between where her dad lived in the big family house out in the leafy suburbs. She turned onto her other side and closed her eyes again. If only sleep would come. But then, for no apparent reason, she thought of the time when her father was caught up in some involved business matter that apparently went wrong. Her mother was still alive then, and even though Natalie was only a small girl, she could still recall the nights when her dad was apparently unable to sleep and her mother kept him company in the study down below. She could hear their muffled voices. And one night there was a car in the driveway which took off with screaming tyres and what sounded like a shot rang out. She never knew what had caused that one upset in their otherwise tranquil existence in that comfortable old home. The incident was never mentioned again in the family. But then she was wide awake again. She sat bolt upright in bed. There it was again. A sound at her front door. She waited. 
she'd stopped breathing. She was straining her ears. Was it her imagination or... No. There it was again. A gentle knock on the door. And a voice calling out to her. A muffled voice. She recognised it. Her blood ran cold. She went rigid from head to toe as blind fear took possession of her. Thank God the door was locked. She emitted air from her lungs, slowly, silently, and waited. There it was again. Natalie, Natalie, open this door. She couldn't utter a sound, much less move. She stared into the darkness of the room and began to feel slightly dizzy. Natalie, if you don't let me in, I'll have to force my way in. I know you're alone in this building, so why not be a sensible girl and open up? There was a distinct new edge of menace to the voice. She managed to move her feet towards the side of the bed. Then silently and slowly she felt for the floor with her toes and got out of bed. She came upright and moved towards the closet, but it was full of her clothes, hastily bundled in that morning during the move. Then she chose the window and moved behind the curtain, covering her body with it. But her feet were sticking out at the bottom and... Natalie, it won't help. I know you're in there. Her fingers reached for the window catch. She turned around and looked outside. Below the window was a narrow ledge, just a few inches wide. If she could get out and somehow... But she'd always been afraid of heights, and the street below seemed very far away in the dim light. Then she heard the sharp, dry crackle of wood breaking. Fear was once again gripping at her throat, and her heart was banging against her ribs. Please! Please go away! She heard her own strangled voice pleading. Please! Please leave me alone! Please! But hardly any sound came from her lips. Oh, if only she'd locked her bedroom door... I'm coming to get you, Natalie, she heard him say, followed by his approaching footsteps across the bare floor of her small sitting room. With bated breath, she crouched down in front of the window. Her entire body was now shaking with fear, and cold sweat was making her shaking hands clammy. Don't be afraid, Natalie. What we have to do will not take long, and I'll try not to hurt you too much. I'll make it quick. Please... Who are you? Why me? But her voice was hardly audible. She could see his dark form in the glow through the curtains from the street below. He was approaching her, stealthily, slowly, like a stalking animal. She couldn't see his face. He was wearing a dark balaclava. But she could see an icy glint in the hollows where his eyes would be. He was only a few feet away from her. Desperation gave her the strength to pull herself upright, fumble for a second or two with the window catch. She opened the window hastily and climbed outside. Another second or two, her toes found the cold ledge and she dropped herself onto it, still clinging onto the windowsill. Don't be stupid, Natalie. You'll fall. He obviously didn't expect her to try to escape in this way. Desperate to get away from him also made her let go of the windowsill. She flattened herself against the wall next to the window on the outside of the building. She edged away, one small step followed by another. She didn't dare look down. The night breeze was cold as it chilled her shivering body through her flimsy nightclothes, but the tears on her cheeks were hot. Then she saw the sleeved arm and a black-gloved hand reaching out of the bedroom window towards her. You're doing a very dangerous thing, Natalie. Holding herself tightly pressed against the cold, hard wall of the building, she felt a bit safer. Perhaps he would hesitate to risk following her onto the ledge. Slowly, but egged on by sheer fear of him, she moved further along the narrow ledge, still resisting the temptation to look down. But she could not control the sobs which were now racking her slim body as she clung to the wall and kept moving further along the edge. Anything, just to get away from him. I had to do this, Natalie because of what your father did to my dad. Your father thought his money could buy my dad silence, but I will never forget what it did to him. He died a broken man, and all because of your father. I swore vengeance then, 
And when I found your name, your number, and your new address on the office computer system, I knew the time had come. Your father loves you, doesn't he? If anything bad should happen to his daughter, well, that would be fair vengeance, wouldn't it? The bearded computer engineer at the office. So she was right. Her intuition had tried to warn her. She remained quiet, and inch by inch, she kept moving further and further away from the window. She was beginning to feel nauseous. Three stories below, another ambulance screeched by, followed by a police car. If only, if only... She tried to scream, but the scream died in her throat as her left foot slipped. In desperation, and in danger of losing her balance completely, she reached out and managed to grab hold of the sill of her sitting room window. Her strength, however, was not enough, and she felt herself losing her hold. Willing herself not to lose her balance, she looked down for the first time. The space beneath her took on the appearance of a bottomless chasm, with the street lights twinkling below. It seemed to be an eternity away. Then she slipped and lost her balance completely. At that moment, the window above her opened, and his gloved hand reached out and grabbed her by the wrist. He pulled her body, now limp with fear, up and into the open window. Once inside, he laid her down on the bare floor, slapped her face and turned to shut the window. You're a very stupid girl to have tried that stunt. You should have known you won't get away from me. We have some unfinished business to complete, you and I. She realised that this was her final chance to get away from him. Mustering all of her strength, she scrambled up from the floor and ran towards the front door of the flat. She reached for the doorknob and tried to open the door, but the doorknob came out of the door. She could hear the intruder behind her muttering and swearing in the dark as he fell over a chair. A glass vase fell from the coffee table and shattered on the floor. He swore again. She reinserted the doorknob, turned it and pulled. The door opened and she found herself outside in the passageway, leading towards the lifts. The lifts! Once again she thought of the caretaker on the ground floor who seemed to be perpetually missing, apparently making the rounds of the building. She decided against the lifts and the stairs, as her pursuer would definitely catch up with her. Blinded by fear, she ran in the opposite direction, towards the large ornamental windows which marked the end of the long passage. She could hear his muffled voice calling out to her and his hurried footsteps gaining on her. They sounded hollow and full of menace in the silence of the vast, unoccupied new building. When she reached the bright windows, she hurled her body against the expanse of gold-tinted glass in a desperate effort to get out of the building and away from her pursuer. She heard the faraway sound of a security alarm going off somewhere in the building as the shards of broken glass fell onto the floor around her. She could taste the salty warmth of blood on her tongue and her head was aching and spinning. Then she lost all consciousness. Natalie Sims woke up at noon the next day and became aware of the fact that she was safely huddled up in bed. She pulled the sheet aside and peered around the room. Pale green walls, other beds. She was in hospital. How are you feeling, Miss Sims? Someone inquired. A nurse. Your father came to see you this morning, but you were still resting. He said he'd come to see you again later. What... What happened? asked Natalie wearily. You don't know. You seem to have had a small accident during the night. The caretaker said he thought you may have walked in your sleep and fell against a glass window. But don't worry, no real harm came to you. A few cuts and bruises, but you'll be fine in a day or so. Fortunately, he found you because you were bleeding a lot. Now, how do you feel? For Natalie, the next few days passed in a confused blur. Nobody seemed even to want to believe the details of what had really happened around midnight in her flat that night. Not even the police officer who came to interview her twice. Her father seemed furious with her for creating such an irresponsible incident, as he called it, 
and added that it was clear proof that Natalie was not yet ready to be responsible for her own well-being and living by herself away from his care and her family home. Then she remembered the state her flat had been in. The overturned chair in the sitting room, the broken vase, the open bedroom window. She called the nurse. I was coming to see you in any case, the nurse announced. We've decided to discharge you. Now don't you go and have any more bad dreams, OK? Sleepwalking can sometimes be very dangerous. Natalie bit her tongue. Detective Sergeant Wilkins is waiting for you. He would like to escort you back to your home. Rather nice of him, don't you think? The nurse continued as she helped Natalie get dressed in some of her old clothes from the house her father had left at the reception desk. He just wants to ask me more silly questions, Natalie said bitterly. Why won't anybody believe me? I didn't walk in my sleep. It really happened. Oh, it's nothing to feel bad about, the nurse remarked offhandedly and handed Natalie the flowers Nancy and the girls at the office had sent. Natalie didn't say anything. Actually, she felt like crying. Detective Sergeant Wilkins didn't say much in the car either. When they reached her flat on the third floor, the front door was shut but left unlocked. I just want to have a quick look round, he said curtly. If you will wait out here, please, miss, I won't be long. After a short while, he reappeared. He left the front door open for her to enter. Everything seems to be in good order, Miss Sims. Absolutely no sign of disturbance, except you had left your bedside radio on. Been listening to any scary radio plays lately? he asked crisply. Before she could utter a sound, he departed. She stared at his tall figure fast receding down the passageway towards the lifts, with the words still unformed on her lips. What about the broken vase? The chair? The open bedroom window? Filled with hurt and silent humiliation, she entered the flat and shut the door behind her. The key was back in the lock, on the inside. She looked around the sitting room. The chair back in its place. Only the glass vase which she was sure had been standing on the coffee table, was missing. Nor were there any broken pieces on the clean floor. With a soft cry of frustrated disbelief, she ran into a small kitchen and looked inside the bin under the sink. Nothing there either. Then she ran into the bedroom. Her bed was neatly made, and the window was firmly shut. In fact, there was absolutely no sign that anything untoward had disturbed the serenity of the flat. Had she really just dreamt it all? Had she really sleepwalked into the passage outside and walked into the ornamental window at the end of the passageway? Were they, the hospital, the police, even her father, all right and she was wrong? Had she actually imagined or dreamt it all? Feeling very tired and very much alone, not to mention completely confused... She flopped down onto her bed. Then the telephone rang and stopped. She held her breath. She suddenly felt very cold. Her lips began to tremble. Then the telephone rang again. A muffled animal-like scream of naked fear gurgled up in her throat. She jumped up from the bed stumbled, regained her balance, and ran to the front door. She reached for the door handle to open it, but the handle came away in the palm of her hand. Gardener's Choice by Mark Alexander, read by Bill Oddie. Yes, it was a very nice house. Old-fashioned, a bit rambling. We did quite a lot of DIY. Well, one thing he wasn't short of was time. But the garden, large and nicely secluded. A bit neglected, but he'd make it a picture, and Kitty would be just as keen. 
all her life she'd wanted to grow flowers. And considering everything, the price was right. In fact, remarkably good. We'll, uh, we'll take it, young woman, Alfred Parsons announced. And the girl from the estate agency glanced quickly at Mrs Parsons, who nodded. Not that she was one to let her husband make all the decisions like her old dad had done, far from it. But she and Alfred had been married for so long there was no need for a lot of words when they were in accord. The girl from the estate agency calculated her commission and smiled. They moved in as soon as possible, and when the removal van had gone, Alfred and Kitty stood on the big lawn surveying their house and the shrubs that surrounded it, their neglected flower bed in the shade of a long brick wall, and the glory of the sun as it dipped below their trees. Oh, to think of it, exclaimed Kitty. A house of our own, after all those years in the flat. Aye, agreed Alfred. It'll be like starting all over again. I don't mind telling you, love, I, I felt right heartsick after I was given the shove at Proctor's. <laughs> Early retirement, they called it. Uh, but it was a bloody shove, making way for a bloody computer. And me that's been in print all my life. But now I'll, uh, I'll have the garden to, to take my mind off things. You know, I reckon I'll plant some vegetables. He became carried away with mental pictures of rows of green things standing to attention. He was a tall, easy-going man, and Kitty, who was short and plump, was equally easy-going. Perhaps that was why that, after years of married life, they'd had few real differences and were still happy with each other. But first, <clears throat> I'll tidy up the paths, Alfred continued, and cut back those shrubs before they take over. And I'd like to put a flower bed right in the middle of the lawn, said Kitty. And that was how it all began. Morning! Alfred looked up from his weeding to see that a bald head had appeared over the top of the brick wall. It reminded him of the cartoon that had been a favourite wartime piece of graffiti, and he remembered how his boyhood sense of humour had been tickled by the scrawled captions that always followed the word what, such as what, no bananas. Um, morning, Alfred returned, amusing himself with the thought that the head might reply, what, no beer. Instead it said, um, <clears throat> name's Hodge. Oh, um, <clears throat> please to meet you. My, um, my name's Parsons. Alfred Parsons. Oh, I'm an Alfred too. <laughs> how, uh, how are you finding your new home then? I must say the wife and I were glad to have neighbours at last. Place has been empty a good while. Oh, we like it. Especially the garden. Hope to get it right soon. Aye, said Alfred Hodge, producing an old-fashioned pipe. Been neglected it has. Aye agreed Alfred Parsons, hoping to learn something about the previous owner. He was not to be disappointed. The, uh, the old man who used to live in your place was uh, right particular about the garden, which especially the lawn, said Alfred Hodge. He used to, used to wear spiked shoes so that when he mowed it, he aerated it at the same time. <laughs> Give him his due, though. It were like green velvet. His, um, his name was Musgrove. Misery Musgrove, they called him. Ooh, standoffish old sod. He wouldn't chat to you over the wall or anything like that. Oh, no. A dog got into his garden once. It, it was sniffing round his precious lawn, so he shot it. Shot it with an air rifle. Oh, it was hell to pay. And and they, they reckon he used to put poison down for cats. He must have lived in that house for ooh, over over 20 years. He had his wife with him when he first came. She was a lot younger than him. And, and, and remember, she, she wanted to have a flower bed in the middle of his precious lawn. Oh, the rows they had over that. You could hear him over the wall. Terrible! Then she scarpered. No one knew the details, but, you know, I have a pretty good idea she took off with her boyfriend. I tell you, I don't blame her. And the kids made up stories that old Misery had strangled her and buried her in the garden. You know what kids are like. But I told them he wouldn't dig up his beloved lawn even to hide a body. <laughs> when he was really old, he, he used to totter over that grass 
and keep it fertilised and mowed while the rest of the garden went to pot. I was so used to seeing him there, you know, after he died, I, I used to imagine him leaning on his stick, looking at the lawn. I mean, I mean, he weren't no apparition or anything. It's just that, well, I'd, I'd seen him like that every day. Alfred? came a distant voice. Um, you or me? asked Alfred Parsons with a chuckle. Yeah, you. Linda calls me Fred. <laughs> well, see you again. Nice to be neighbourly. Alfred went inside for lunch. And the first thing Kitty said after she'd asked him if he'd washed his hands was, When are you going to dig that flower bed? Alfred and Kitty sat pleasantly in their sitting room, entertaining their next door neighbours. Fred and Alfred argued the merits of a new biological lawn fertiliser, while Linda and Kitty were deep in the pros and cons of microwave cooking. When the time came to sit at the supper table, Fred said, Well, I, uh, I must say, Mrs Parsons, but, um, Kitty, you've, uh, you've got this old place looking very nice. Very nice indeed. And I think, said Linda Hodge, not to be outdone, that Alfred here has done wonders in the garden. It'll be nice when it's finished, said Kitty meaningfully. Oh, I thought it uh, just about was, Fred said. It will be when Alfred makes me a bed in the lawn, won't it, dear? Hmm, said Alfred. Oh, old misery Musgrave would, would rotate in his grave if he knew began Fred, but a glance from Linda silenced him, and she said, Oh, look, Fred, what a pretty tablecloth. Kitty embroidered it herself, you know. Oh, so clever, I can't sew a button myself. <laughs> That's true, said Fred. After the guests had departed, Alfred turned to his wife. Look, Kitty, love, I, I'd, I'd rather not have a bed in the lawn. It, it, it may sound funny, but I... I, I don't want to do it. It, 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 it. It'd spoil the look of the lawn, and well, oh, well, I'd, I'd, I'd just rather not. Alfred Parsons, I never dreamt you could be mean. Oh, Kitty, apart from nailing those shelves in the airing cupboard, I haven't asked anything else of you for days. Oh, but, but love, it's all very well for you to call me love, but if you mean it, you'll dig me that flower bed. Now, come on, don't let's be silly over a little thing like that. I mean, you be a dear and do it for me and, and everything will be all right. I'll plant tulips in it. Be ever so pretty. I've, I've always longed for tulips. Oh, goodness me, is that the time? Oh, come on, up the wooden hill. Look, we'll talk about what shape it should be in the morning. Kitty went to bed determined that Alfred would do as she wished. Alfred went to bed determined he wouldn't. Next morning, Alfred viciously attacked deep-rooted weeds with a trowel, taking his annoyance out on Doc and Dandelion. Why all this bloody fuss over a flower bed? he demanded of himself, thinking of their heated conversation over the breakfast table. Why did Kitty want one anyway? It would spoil a perfectly good stretch of turf. What was it? Green velvet, Fred had called it. It could be made like that again with a little care and lawn tonic. Ruefully, he told himself that he, he must be getting like, uh, what was his name? Musgrave. <laughs> Old misery Musgrave. Hello, said Fred Hodge, raising his bald head over the wall. Here's um, that homemade jam Linda promised Kitty. Must rush, though. Sorry, no time for a chat. Alfred took the jam to the kitchen. After a few appropriate words praising Linda's generosity, Kitty said, Alfred... Are you going to dig me that bed this morning? Hmm? Alfred looked at her keenly. They rarely fell out and he hated any discord between them. And he had known her long enough to sense that this thing went deeper than the words that they'd exchanged. It was bloody well getting out of proportion. Why let a thing like a flower bed, of all things, come between them? Kitty stood waiting. <sighs> right. You win, he said. I'll start right away. He felt better as he took his spade from the tool shed and went to the spot where Kitty had marked out the bed with sticks. He stood ready to drive the spade into the ground, thinking over what he was about to do. 
He was going to cut the sacred turf that old Musgrave had lavished years of love on. He knew he'd be ruining a perfectly good lawn, but at least it would please Kitty. <sighs> Poor old Musgrave. He put his foot on the shoulder of the spade and pushed it down. Immediately he experienced a sick, giddy feeling, as though his vitality was draining away like water out of a bathtub. Something like a frightened bird fluttered in his chest. Bloody hell. This couldn't be it, could it? The dreaded, secretly awaited heart attack. Somewhere it seemed a voice was crying. Stop! 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 He was vaguely conscious of someone behind him. Someone just behind him. He turned Slowly, but nothing. Nobody. Just sunlight on the lawn, a quiver in the air. He leaned on the spade until his breathing became regular again. No, not his heart this time. Not yet. In the kitchen, he said lamely, I, uh, I, I felt a bit faint, I, bending over those busted weeds. I, 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 I think I'll just lie down for a bit, you know. I'll, I'll do the bed tomorrow. But he knew. He lied. Alfred Parsons stood up suddenly and turned quickly. But there was nothing there. There never was. But he could have sworn he'd not been alone. He knelt down again and continued filling a flower pot. He was jumpy. That was it. He was, he was jumpy because of this stupid difference with Kitty. Then he went inside for his mid-morning cup of tea, which he handed to him, coldly. You promised, she began. I know, I know, I know, the bloody bed. Well, no need to talk that way. M might have been all right at Proctor's, but listen, 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 Kitty. I'd... Look, I can't explain it, but I, I cannot dig up that lawn. Look, please, please just forget about it. She gave a mirthless giggle. <laughs> Alfred Parsons, you and I have been together for a long time. And now you refuse me over something that means a lot to me. <sighs> perhaps I'm getting old and you can't be bothered anymore. Or perhaps you're starting to go gaga. But I think it's terrible you're willing to fall out with me over such a little thing. Oh, all right! Alfred shouted, all right! He left the room, and with sudden desperate determination seized the spade and strode back to the lawn where he drove the blade deep into the turf again and again. Stop! 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 screamed a voice through his brain. Damn Musgrave! He wouldn't look round. In with the spade again, turning over the clod. No, there was nobody behind him. He would not turn round. Then he hurled down the spade and stumbled away. I'm going to post office, he called to Kitty through the kitchen window. All right, she said with a choke in her voice. I'll have to do it myself. Kitty, don't go on that lawn, he called. But it was too late. She had gone to get her gardening things. Filled with resentment, Alfred Parsons marched out of his gate in the direction of the high street. Oh, let her dig the bloody bed if she was so keen. A drink in the swan was what he needed. Later, he met Fred Hodge waiting for Linda outside the supermarket. Hello, Alf. Something up? He asked in a way that reminded Alfred of the caricature face looking over a wall, exclaiming, What? No cheer? No, no, no. In, in a bit of a hurry to get home. Look, I'll, I'll see you tonight. He walked away briskly, but he felt better for having met his neighbour. Later he would chat to him over the garden wall, and by then everything would be normal. He'd, he'd make it up with Kitty, help her with the flower bed, and to hell with all these queer feelings. Stress, stress, that's what it was. Being given the heave-ho after 35 years' loyal service, it would stress anybody. And stress made your imagination play funny tricks. He hurried home, and when he was inside the gate, his eyes sought the spot where the flower bed was to be. There, 
in her check dress and gardening gloves, was Kitty. She was lying still on the lawn, the spade close by. Alfred could see where she'd begun to dig. He knew before he reached her that she was dead, and in a vague way, he knew why. As he knelt over her, he was aware of the presence of someone else in the garden. Now, it seemed to be all around him. Yet he knew it was the same presence that earlier he'd felt behind him. Old Misery Musgrave. Poison Pen by Charles Caldwell Read by Julian Clary Chief Superintendent Barksfield surveyed the heap of incoming mail with disfavour. He had enjoyed being a hands-on copper for over a quarter of a century and had only accepted this latest promotion with reluctance, principally in order to gain the increase in salary that went with it. His two sons were fast approaching their last years at the grammar school and were both showing gratifying signs of acquiring grades good enough to gain entry to the university of their choice. But, alas, they were likely to gain the scholarships or bursaries that might ease the financial burden on Jim and his wife Teresa, a primary school teacher. The net result was that Jim Barksfield was doing what he had never wanted to do. He was a pen pusher and successor to the man who had so irritated him over the last few years with his constant obsession with procedures and budgets. Now he was himself that irritant to others and found the role uncomfortable. Today's batch of letters included the usual lengthy directives on policy amendment and codes of practice, complaints from the public, invitations to speak at WIs and other community groups, and routine interdepartmental memos. He slit the envelopes with the letter opener presented to him by his erstwhile colleagues on his elevation in rank. It was engraved with the legend, The pen is mightier than the truncheon. The contents he assigned to the stack of coloured trays, which he mentally labelled urgent, sometime and never. He scanned a letter from Jeff Cotton Mallow, solicitors, to see which tray was appropriate. He read, We enclosed a sealed letter part of the effects of our late client Marcus Webb, which the trustees direct should be passed on to the chief investigating officer in the case of the murder in 1981 of the late Geoffrey Marsh. We understand from our inquiries that you are that officer. Please acknowledge safe receipt of the contents, of which it should be absolutely clear we have no knowledge, etc., etc. Jim Barksfield had spent many sleepless nights wrestling with the still unsolved murder of Geoffrey Marsh, theatre critic, celebrity and self-styled wit. His investigations had been painstakingly thorough, lengthy and inconclusive. There were so many possible suspects, each of whom might have had very good reason for wishing to hasten the demise of this vitriolic man, that it was only Jim's professionalism that was affronted by his failure to bring a guilty party to book. Geoffrey Marsh had been prepared to sacrifice friendship, other people's careers, personal relationships and colleagues' respect in the interest of maintaining his status as the poison pen of Fleet Street. He revelled in the title, which more sensitive souls might perhaps have found uncomfortable. Countless actors and directors had been heard to wish an immediate, slow and painful death on him when they found their livelihoods threatened by reviews, brimming with personal attacks, scorn and, most damaging of all, the neat phrase chosen for wit rather than accuracy and which lingered longer in the reader's memory for that reason. Marsh happily freeloaded off the great and the good, who entertained him on the basis that they might thereby escape being the butt of his poisoned barbs. 
However, the moment he perceived his advantage being greater in their demolition, he had no compunction in, as one wag put it, writing off the hands that fed him. Few therefore mourned when he had been found dead at his home on the outskirts of the village of Lower Pelling. The cause of his death was strychnine poisoning. It had been a classic closed-room scenario, and whilst motives abounded, opportunities and evidence appeared non-existent. The only clues had been a series of anonymous letters threatening his imminent execution, which had been cut and pasted from Marsh's own words printed in newspaper reviews and books. Marsh had taken these to the police, who had been unable to trace the sender. They had all been posted at London mainline stations, and the most painstaking forensic investigation yielded no clues. Marsh took the threat seriously enough to spend a large sum in fortifying Narcissus Cottage to the extent that the emergency services had been unable to gain entry in time to save his life after he had pressed the panic button when overtaken by the first convulsion. No trace of strychnine had been found in the house other than the huge concentration in the arched and contorted corpse. The pathologist's report had concluded that the poison had been taken virtually neat some hours after he last ate or drank. The case had started as a mystery and remained an enigma all these years later. In a final gesture of contempt, he had left his not inconsiderable estate to a publisher with whom he had had a long-standing feud, with the proviso that he should, within three years, publish an anthology of my theatrical critiques and essays. To his credit, the publisher allowed the estate to lapse to the state under the intestacy laws rather than yield to the megalomaniac in death. Jim Barksfield broke the wax seal on the back of the envelope, opened it and removed the audio cassette within. He could not resist playing it immediately. Inspector Barksfield, I hope that by the time you hear this, you will either be chief constable or have retired. To be honest, I suppose that by saying that, I am wishing myself a long life rather than expressing a genuine concern for your advancement. However, I am not sure whether I owe you a debt of gratitude or I should congratulate myself on a job well done. Shall we say the latter, as I am sure you are a highly competent officer? I am, as you will now perhaps have realised, referring to the death of the unspeakable and loathsome Geoffrey Marsh. During the investigation of his murder, one of your sergeants came to talk to my late sister, not knowing of her death as a result of an overdose of tranquilizers some months earlier. He was very kind and apologised for troubling me so soon after my loss. Somewhat surprisingly, it transpired that we shared a love of gardening, in particular the propagation of hybrid roses. We remained in close contact for some years and derived great mutual benefit from our common passion, which it seems he felt unable to share with his colleagues. Ah, well... <laughs> Anyway, I digress. He told me that he was visiting a number of people who might have had cause to wish harm to Marsh. My sister had been an actress whose career never recovered from a savage review of her performance of Cleopatra at the London Shakespeare Festival some years earlier. It actually destroyed her confidence rather than restricted the office of work, which was still gratifyingly many. Despite the surface bitchery, the theatrical profession can rally round in the face of a common enemy, and it did so in my Constance's case. But alas, she could not expunge the memory of being referred to by Marsh as, and I quote, a stilted and posturing performer who has for far too long strained the audience's willing suspension of disgust. How a postmenopausal woman, with the figure of a sculpture rejected by Epstein and a voice not so much projected as hurled in the face of an unsuspecting audience like so much rancid offal, could have the gall to accept the role of Cleopatra in the first place defeats this reviewer. Age has most certainly withered her, and the Egyptian queen's infinite variety seemed extremely stale to the point of decay to this customer. My sympathies to the asp, which was the most animated participant in the final scene, despite the sagging frugality of its last meal. As usual, he had offered the sensation junkies and harpies who feed on the humiliation of others their daily sacrifice, and my darling Constance was never able to shake off the viciousness of the attack. 
The coroner's verdict of accidental death was a direct result of the last act of kindness of a sympathetic doctor to a gentle and broken woman. My greatest pain was that none of the many people who loved her were able to help to sustain her self-belief in the face of this vile and heartless attack. I resolved to kill the man who had in effect murdered my sister. But I saw no reason to sacrifice myself in order to do so. Various plans founded on the distinct likelihood of my being caught. But an article in a TV listings magazine about Marsh's daily routine solved my problem. He was, it transpired, a man of strict routine and was obviously susceptible to flattery. I discovered that he had no secretary, who indeed could bear to work for such a loathsome specimen, and answered all incoming mail personally each day in the late afternoon, then walking down to the village post box with his dog, a poodle, naturally. I knew my moment had come. I had already been sending him anonymous letters threatening his imminent demise. It was gratifying to learn later, via the gutter press that he fed so diligently in life, that he had taken the threat seriously enough to barricade himself into his home. My one fear had been that the stomach pump might save his execrable life. I started to write fulsome letters of praise to him, always enclosing self-addressed stamped envelopes. He replied and smugly accepted all my flattery. My final letter enclosed a large colour photograph of Marsh, which I asked him to sign and return. I had, in the meantime, borrowed some strychnine from the garden shed of a happily careless friend, who had acquired it to deal with a mole which was disfiguring the smoothness of his much-loved lawn. Being rather fond of mouldy warp and his friends, I like to think that I made much better use of the small amount of poison I purloined. I mixed the strychnine with a soluble gum which I coated on the flap of the envelope. When the envelope returned, I was able to dispose of the evidence of my execution, having achieved my objective without ever, to my knowledge, having the unpleasant necessity of coming anywhere near my victim. Obviously, I had never been able to claim credit for the finest act of my life, which had been a source of some slight chagrin over the years, although I have never for a second regretted what I did. Somehow, though, I need to let knowledge of my deed live after me, even if only in your mind. Whether you choose to noise my guilt abroad is a matter for you, Mr. Barksfield. Part of me would like to protect my sister from the stigma of suicide. Another part earnestly desires the exposure of her vile murderer. As for me, the bubble reputation troubles me now not a jot, I suspect. As Cleopatra's handmaiden said, the bright day is done and we are for the dark. Jim Barksfield listened to the static hiss of the tape for a few seconds before turning it off and rising to look out of the window. A moment later he sat down, put the cassette into his jacket pocket and lifted the first of today's pile of letters from the urgent tray. Just For You, by Robert Eastland, read by Hannah Gordon. Rosie wasn't sure what she thought of the house the first time she saw it. As they drove up the steep driveway that first morning, it towered over them, a dense mass of stone and ivy. They parked on the graveled area at the front and found lawns to the side, well kept and decked out with garden furniture, then a patio and an orchard, and at the back, flower beds rich in August bloom. Rosie still wasn't sure. The deep woods of Brackenthwaite came down virtually to the garden hedge, and they'd driven along the valley from Lakewell for ten minutes without seeing another car. It was very isolated. Sheila, on the other hand, was enthused. She spent the first ten minutes at the front, being wowed by the bleak and misty grandeur of Crummock Water. Then the next hour, busying around like a bee, even getting Sergeant Cooper to help. He was a big, heavy block of a man, with iron-grey hair 
and a tough, weathered face, but he was still in awe of Rosie, standing there, hat in hand, constantly telling her what an honour it was to have such a distinguished actress living among them. He even seemed impressed that Sheila was Rosie's agent and willingly helped them move in, taking off his tunic and rolling the sleeves back on his brawny arms. He was certainly a reassuring presence in so remote a place, and perhaps a welcome relief after all those lean, unsmiling, trench-coated men from Scotland Yard. He was certain they'd be comfortable here, he told them repeatedly, as they explored the various rooms of the house. It had always been popular as a holiday home, had this old place. Rosie had to admit it was nicely furnished, even if the upholstery was a little musty, and the central feature, the hall, with its stone-flagged floor, slate hearth and upstairs balcony, was quite magnificent. Now she understood the price tag. It was several hours before they were properly installed, and Sergeant Cooper gallantly withdrew, backtracking across the drive to his panda car, still smiling and insisting that if they had any problems at all, they could get him at Lakewell Police Station, just ask for him, uh, Sergeant Cooper, that was. When he had gone, Sheila joined Rosie by the front door and put her arms round her. Happy? she asked. Rosie nodded, but the tears in her eyes told otherwise. My God, she... driven from my own home. Sheila gave her a gentle peck on the cheek. It'll not be for long, honey. Don't you worry. They'll get him. Rosie smiled bravely and wiped the tears away. At the beginning, it was phone calls in the middle of the night. No deep breathing, just the unearthly silence and the terrible presence of the unseen listener. Fans, the police had told her wearily. Stupid, besotted fans. Even a faded glamour puss could still attract them then, she thought bitterly. But it was some kind of fan who had suddenly begun to carry out sex murders in her honour, almost like they were sacrifices to her name. Just for you, my sweet. Just for you. She shuddered every time she recalled those words and that sibilant, whispering voice on the telephone. A natural progression, police psychological profilers had called it. The listening was the stalk. The boasting and gloating on the phone was the catch. What followed next? She'd begun to wonder. The kill, perhaps? One thing was certain. London had quickly become too hot for Rosie Crayford. He'd called her every night he'd murdered. Nine times in six months. As she stood before the strange mirror that night in the strange bathroom, she wondered if 38 years had really been so cruel, or was it simply him? Oh, she still had her fulsome figure, her flowing auburn hair and deep green eyes. But how to explain the ashen pallor, the telltale lines of grief and weariness? Sheila joined her, her hands still covered in rings and bangles, even slippered and nightgowned as she was now. She handed Rosie a large glass of wine. Rosie couldn't help but smile. Late that night, however, the sound of a telephone ringing from somewhere below woke Rosie up. She was halfway downstairs when the terror came back to her. The moment she began screaming, however, the phone stopped ringing. Sheila was beside her in a second, but Rosie could hardly speak. The light was on on the stairs and landing, but the darkened pit of the hallway was unexplored territory. Rosie gazed down into it. She... It was the phone again. I heard the phone. Honey, you were dreaming, said Sheila patiently. You must have been. We haven't got a phone. Rosie almost swooned with relief as it came back to her. This was one of the reasons they'd chosen this place. It was cut off. It was a hidden little niche, completely unconnected to that dark and dangerous world of madmen with telephones. She laid her head on Sheila's shoulder. Oh, oh, thank, thank God, thank, thank God. I've got more good news for you. 
her agent told her. Richie's coming up tomorrow. Rosie looked up, delighted. Sheila gave her a big smile. He left a message down at the village post office. You were in bed when I got back with it. Didn't want to wake you. Better late than never, I suppose, Rosie said, with the old pout that had once slammed a thousand box offices. He's a busy man, hun, Sheila reminded her. Boyfriend or not? Rosie could only agree. She'd sleep easier now. Richie Robinson was over ten years younger than Rosie, and Sheila didn't approve of him. Early next morning, though, as she drew back the curtains on another glorious day, the calm surface of Crummock Water mirroring the tree-lined shore and a blue sky dotted with bits of fleecy cloud, she was mightily relieved to see him cruising up onto the drive in his Harley-Davidson. Rosie was still asleep upstairs, so Sheila went out to meet him alone. He just dismounted and was taking off his helmet and shaking the blonde locks out over his tasselled black jacket. For once, however, his unspoiled, pretty boy face was grim. Immediately, she knew something was wrong. Not another one, she asked tentatively. Last night, he confirmed. Sheila put a hand to her mouth as he described the familiar state of the woman's body found dumped in the Thames the recognisable, almost ritualistic mutilations. Jesus, she whispered. Rosie said she thought she'd heard the phone ringing, but but no, that isn't possible. <sighs> Listen, Richie, she's still pretty strung out. You'd better not tell her. Richie began to unpack his gear. He wouldn't tell her, he said sullenly, but she was bound to read about it in the papers. We aren't getting the papers, Sheila said decisively, as she led him into the house and through to the kitchen. Not at the moment. Richie, as usual, not trusting Sheila, wondered what would happen if he phoned again. Sheila insisted that he couldn't. They didn't have a phone. He then wondered if that was safe, all the way out here. It's her mind I'm worried about at the moment, said Sheila, handing him a mug of coffee. No one knows we're here. Richie didn't say anything for a moment, but stood by a side window drinking. He was looking out beyond the grounds to the steep and shadowy woods. She knew what he was thinking. He was thinking they'd cooped themselves up, hemmed themselves in, he being an open road man, of course, one of those guys who just couldn't settle down. She almost snorted in contempt, couldn't grow up more like Jesus. Rosie certainly could pick them. He suddenly turned round. Haven't the Cumbrian police offered any kind of protection like the Met did? She shrugged and began to clear her breakfast things. Of course they did. I turned them down. Richie could hardly believe it. With the two of them stuck out in a big old house like this with probably a hundred different ways for somebody to get in. Sheila was determined not to be drawn. Richie... Nobody knows we're here. He began to storm around, slapping his forehead. What if somebody had been watching their every move, he wondered. Followed them up the motorway, even. Sheila was pretty sure nobody had. Pretty sure, eh? said Richie scornfully. The Lakewell police will be looking in on us, she replied. Wooden tops, he snapped. He took a thickly folded road map out from his pocket and spread it out on the breakfast bar. They had to talk to someone important. Get a proper guard, he said. For a minute or so, they scanned the crumpled map, searching for the nearest decent-sized town. Eventually, they found it. Carlisle, nearly 40 miles away. Richie looked up at her accusingly. This is some hideaway you've got yourself, Sheila. When Rosie came down later on, Sheila told her that Richie had arrived, but was now off on his bike somewhere, seeing the police. She didn't mention that there'd been another murder. They spent the rest of the day reading, playing cards, and walking together through the steep, sun-dappled woods. They never strayed far from the house. Rosie felt naked in the open air these days, and grabbed Sheila's arm at the slightest sound. Sheila herself wondered at how quiet it was. A warm, still afternoon 
was followed by a typical Lake District storm. As the evening drew down sultrier by the hour, heavy green thunderheads full to bursting stacked up in the west, dwarfing the rolling summits of Ennerdale and Red Pike. By nightfall, lightning was sparking in the distance and a torrent of rain falling, flooding from the gutters over the bay windows. They tried to ignore it and sat down in easy chairs in front of the hearth, reading. Every so often, Sheila would glance up at Rosie. Rosie would smile back, though she flinched at every crack of thunder. Resolutely, however, she always got back to her book. Then, the lights went out. Before she knew what she was doing, Rosie was screaming for Sheila, who scrambled over to her. It's all right, honey, it's all right, it's just a blackout, probably the storm. Flickering badly, the lights came on again. Sheila gave Rosie a cuddle. See? Rosie, however, was shivering violently. God, I wish Richie would hurry up. He's been gone all day. Then the lights went out again, plunging them into utter blackness. Rosie cried out hoarsely. Sheila tried to calm her, insisting that it was only the storm. She couldn't say the same a moment later. When somewhere close by them, a telephone began to ring. There was a moment of paralysis. Then Rosie leaped to her feet. You, you said we, we, we didn't have a phone, she stammered. You said, you said. Sheila, badly shaken, but at least trying to stay level-headed, had also stood up. She looked vainly around in the dark. We can't do anything until the lights come on. Just relax. Rosie's voice had now risen to a wail, however. What if somebody's turned them off? Sheila wondered exactly who could have turned them off. But Rosie's answer turned her blood cold. The same person who doesn't know we're here, she said, who's ringing us on a phone we don't have. Sheila was about to reply when the lights came on again. The two women looked across the room at each other, both pale as ice. The phone was still ringing out, however, and in the full light, they traced it quickly to the drinks cabinet, to inside the drinks cabinet. Between the bottles and decanters, they found a portable phone. Just as Sheila picked it up, it ceased to ring. They exchanged glances, the same thoughts rushing through both their heads. Neither had brought their phones with them. Richie had one, but it was fixed in his car, and he'd come up on his bike. Somebody's been in here. Rosie breathed. And then, with a crackle of electricity, the lights went out again, this time with an air of permanency. Lightning suddenly split the sky overhead. The rain teemed in the windows. Rosie staggered helplessly across the room as thunder boomed down through the old house. He's here, she sobbed. It was Sheila! For once, Sheila's mouth had gone dry. She couldn't answer. To deny it would simply be to lie. Nobody left portable phones in drinks cabinets. Not without coming back to look for them. And certainly, nobody broke into your house to leave you one. Not without some ulterior motive. There was a sudden, single knock on the front door. It was followed by another, this one much louder. Richie! Rosie whispered almost beyond hope. Richie! Is it rich? He... The actress began to scramble towards the door. Sheila was too frozen to stop her. Then there was a third knock, this more a violent blow. It halted Rosie in her tracks. Both the women held their breath. The fourth knock was a resounding crash. Involuntarily, they both screamed. Rosie hurriedly retreated. For seconds, there was silence. Then, from beyond the front door, a crunching of gravel the sound of huge feet moving slowly away. A brilliant glare of lightning fleetingly threw everything into focus, almost blinding them, but not so that they didn't see the hulking silhouette making its way past the bay window towards the back of the house. Rosie might have shrieked full-bloodedly had Sheila not clamped a warning hand over her mouth. We, we could use the phone, Sheila hissed. The one he left. Rosie nodded dumbly 
and as stealthily as they could, they began to look for it. The blackness was complete, however. They crawled and scrabbled and searched, but nowhere could they find it. In their fevered terror, neither could remember where they had left the thing. Rosie was now weeping again, copiously, helplessly hugging herself on the verge of a total breakdown. Then she looked quickly up. Sheila, my God, he's gone round the back of the house. The climbing ivy, Jesus, the bedroom windows are open. Sheila sucked in her breath, her mind racing. Suddenly she burst into action. I close them, she said, scrambling to the stairs and up them. Rosie screamed that she shouldn't, that he might already be up there, but Sheila ignored her. He couldn't be up there, not yet. A big shape like that couldn't squeeze in through those little windows without a struggle. In any case, it had to be the windows. They might dash out to the car, but in this dark she didn't even think she could find the keys. They couldn't leave. The only option was to stay put and keep him out. As she reached the landing, however, and began to feel her way hand over hand along the banister, the front door thundered to the sound of furious knocking. But this was normal knocking, human knocking. The sound of somebody beating frantically on the wood with a fist. And there was a man's voice, too, full of concern. Sheila stopped in her tracks. It... it sounded like Sergeant Cooper. It was Sergeant Cooper. He was shouting Rose's name over and over again, asking if she was all right. Legs like rubber, Sheila moved back to the top of the stairs. Down below, she could hear Rosie frantically unchaining the door. As it swung open, fresh air gusted in. The noise of the storm was suddenly amplified. Sergeant Cooper sounded relieved to find them alive. There had been an identical murder just down the valley, he was saying urgently. The killer might be here now. They must get out as quickly as they could. Rosie was too hysterical to make him realise that indeed the killer was there. He put his coat over her head and urged her out into the rain, telling her to get into his car. He turned in the doorway and called Sheila. She was coming, she said, coming. By the time she reached the bottom of the stairs, though, she could hardly stand. The rain was still lashing down outside, the wind blowing through the house. Sheila knew she was ready to collapse. That was when she heard the explosion of glass and splintering wood somewhere up in the bedroom. She tried to jump up, but couldn't. She was literally paralysed with fear. A scream strangled in her throat. She listened helplessly as a bedroom door crashed open. Then feet came clumping violently along the landing, turned at the top, and came straight down the stairs towards her at terrible speed. As a hand grabbed her shoulder, Sheila fainted. She came to, feeling sick and shivering. Someone was forcing brandy to her lips. She looked weakly up. In the light of several torches, she saw Richie. Relief flooded through her. He wanted to know what the hell had been going on. They'd been hanging on the doorbell for ages and ended up trying to break the door down, then having to force their way in through one of the upstairs windows. Luckily, he'd had some police assistance. Where was Rosie? Sheila looked up at him. Her mind was too numb with shock to say that on a night like this, what the hell did he expect had been going on? To say that of course they hadn't been able to hear the doorbell, the power was off. But most importantly of all, to say that she thought Rosie was with them. He wasn't in a listening mood, however. He was too busy making excuses for being so late. The storm was a nightmare, the district in chaos. But he knew he had to get back quickly. Something Sheila had said about the Lakewell police looking in on them, he checked. There were no police at Lakewell, never had been. Sheila's brandy glass dropped to the carpet. Somewhere in that darkened room, the phone began to ring. Trail, 
by Paul Finch. Read by Leslie Grantham. She was a forlorn figure, Albert thought, as the train pulled slowly out of Euston. He'd settled down about ten seats behind her and dug a crumpled copy of the sun out of his Mac pocket to while away the trip. But he couldn't keep his eyes off the woman, even though all she was doing was sitting there, gazing out of the window. She surely couldn't see much through those opaque sunglasses. He watched her carefully. After a moment, she loosened her coat and pulled back her crimson cowl, shaking free a mass of ginger locks. Nice. He wondered what she was like from the front. He still not had a proper look at her. Only from behind, the prerogative of a private investigator, he supposed. She was trim, though, with an elegant shape, and walked smartly on black high heels. Her fur overcoat came down to the back of her knees, showing sturdy calves beneath, sheathed in nylon with straight seams. It wasn't the first erotic fix he'd had in the pursuit of unfaithful wives. The clothing they wore to meet their lovers in sometimes astounded even him. The spots chosen for the illicit liaisons were often more daring than safe. He'd lost count of the number of times he'd crept up, camera in hand, on cars parked in open woodland, on back alleys behind nightclubs, even on bus shelters and secluded beaches. It was certainly more fun than tracking burglars and bank robbers. Not as much bread mine. He'd made quite a lot of that in his last few years in the Met. Quite a lot. So much, in fact, that they'd finally looked into it. And so, here he was minus pension and a second-class railway carriage on the trail of another dirty weekend. He tried to get into the sun, but the woman kept distracting him. She was leaning her head against the side, panelling with a weary, languid air. The window beside her was streaming with February rain, the land beyond it a rolling, dismal tableau of houses, fields, roads and factories. He wasn't entirely sure where she was travelling to, so he'd been forced to buy a ticket all the way. Carlisle, in fact. But she seemed to be travelling light, only a handbag strung over one shoulder. It was a more mysterious job than usual. Albert had received a generous bundle of notes through the post, with no cover letter, and then a phone call from a whispery voiced man who simply said that he wanted his wife following. He suspected that she was up to something and wanted to know exactly what. If Albert found out, there'd be treble that amount of cash waiting on his front doormat the morning after he got back. There'd been no address given, no name, not even a photograph of the target. If he got to Euston for 9am on Friday, he'd been told, he'd see her by gate 15. He couldn't miss her. The voice had then gone on to describe the fur overcoat, the cowl scarf of crimson wool, the black patent shoes, even the seamed stockings. It hadn't got a detail wrong. She'd be well covered, it had had it. The cowl would be pulled up and she'd probably have dark glasses on. The bitch never took the risk of being recognised. Albert understood that. He'd once followed a woman for a whole fortnight who went to a secret tryst dressed as a Carmelite nun. The private eye made several trips back and forth along the train, to the toilets and the buffet, but the woman never strayed from her seat. The train passed through Birmingham, Crewe and Wigan, and still she leaned against the window gazing out. Occasionally she would rearrange her posture and huddle into her coat as if a sudden chill had gone past her. Then at Lancaster she abruptly stood up, pulled her cowl up, replaced her sunglasses and moved to the doors. Albert was almost taken by surprise. He spilled coffee all over his raincoat in his haste to put it on and follow her. He knew that he couldn't afford to let her get out of his sight. Occasionally, even if the quarry didn't suspect they were being followed, they'd take some bizarre circumnavigatory route, just to throw off any imaginary bloodhounds. She walked casually out through the ticket hall, Albert never far behind, but exercising care not to crowd her. You could never afford to get too close. If this woman had any inkling that he was there, however, she hadn't shown it yet. She hadn't looked behind her once, all the way from London. It was now midday in the northern sky, a power wash of rain clouds. An icy wind was blowing and Albert wished he'd put something warmer on. He watched across the station concourse towards a taxi rank and slowly tensed. This was always the difficult part. Contrary to popular belief, jumping into a taxi and saying, follow that cab, would rarely ensure that you didn't lose someone. It wasn't that the cabbies weren't willing. Most of them were more enthusiastic than you were. But without police driver training, it was virtually impossible to stay in touch, especially in heavy traffic. One stubborn set of lights, one busy roundabout could be enough to spoil the whole job. To Albert's surprise, however, the woman didn't take a taxi. 
but passed them by and walked off the concourse, following signposts to the town centre. Bemused, he went after her. He'd only been on this case for one morning, yet already he'd covered more ground than he usually did in the month back in London. He hoped his mysterious employer would be as generous with the expenses as he was with wages. He kept a careful 50 yards or so behind her, now wary that any second she could stop to look in a shop window or turn to cross the road. She never did, however, but continued straight on, head down against the sodden wind. Even in this weather, the university town was lively and bustling, but the woman still cut a solitary figure. So far, it had been one lonely trail Albert reflected for the both of them. Five minutes later, she entered the information office in the town's central bus station. Albert stopped on the corner, watching tentatively. She was only out of sight for perhaps a minute and re-emerged with an information leaflet, which she glanced quickly through as she crossed the various bays and slip roads. Albert had to move sharply to keep up. He just had time to see her climbing into a big double-decker. The driver was on the verge of settling down in front of the wheel. Albert ran. He made it a split second before the doors hissed shut behind him. The unmistakable legs and heels were disappearing upstairs. Albert glanced up after her and mopped a trickle of sweat from his brow. Yeah? Somebody asked. He turned and saw the driver staring curiously at him. He was a heavy, middle-aged man with a hard, thin mouth. Where to, mate? Oh, um... Albert was suddenly lost for words. As far as you go, please, uh, where's the terminus? Morecambe Bay, said the driver, with a sudden look of suspicion. He had noticed Albert's cockney lilt and now his appearance as well. A shabby raincoat, a mop of greaseback grey hair, unshaven cheeks and a gold stud in one ear was never likely to commend you to the hard-nosed northerner. Albert tried to play it down, smiling and shrugging, as if he travelled Britain's buses without ever really knowing where he was going for a hobby and he forked out the requisite cash. Then he sat down to wait. There was no need to go upstairs. That was pushing his luck perhaps too much. And in any case, the woman couldn't leave the bus without him seeing her. Minutes passed as the double-decker rolled out through drab, rain-swept fields. The sky ahead was that vast, awesome expanse of nothing so common on the coast in winter, full of Atlantic squalls. Morecambe, Albert thought with some consternation. What a place to carry on an affair in. He was a South London boy, born and bred. He had a positive need for the hub and throng of the city. He didn't know the place, but to him, Morecambe, like so many bleak seaside towns, was just another crumbling Victorian edifice, filled with people who were counting the days to their ultimate retirement. The sooner he got this job over and done with, the better. They reached the result in less than half an hour and came to halt on the promenade, where the woman finally disembarked. Albert watched for a second, then rolled his paper up and followed. She was only about 30 yards ahead of him, walking southwards past the numerous boarded-up candy floss stalls and closed ticket offices. On his right, the famous sands rolled off to a distant horizon, where the white sea frothed and burst and swarmed with off-season gulls diving for herring. The air was filled with rain, but also sour with salt. They walked for minutes along the empty parade, the private eye acutely aware of how exposed and conspicuous he was. He also began to wonder if the woman knew he was there, her failure to look behind her even once was now more like a stubborn refusal, a determination not to take any precautions, as if she couldn't care less. Then she turned sharply right and went down a flight of steps to the beach. Albert moved to the barrier and stared after her, totally confused. She was hardly dressed for it, but she struck out nevertheless, high heels, stockings and all, plodding over the damp, ridge sand towards the distant waterline. The feeling that she was aware of him suddenly became a conviction. Albert trotted down the steps after her. She was walking quickly and had gained some ground on him, so he had to hurry to keep up. He'd only been on the beach for a few minutes before he was plunging to the shoelaces in ice-cold seawater, or sliding and sinking on a shifting surface. Albert glanced behind him. Already the concrete promenade and row of drab shop fronts behind it seemed miles away. The wind was whipping his coat and pelting him with rain. He looked back to the woman, now a distant figure in black, moving steadily southwest towards a jutting headland of sand dunes. Almost immediately, the truth struck him. She was meeting no lover. Nothing of the sort, in fact. He'd heard how treacherous the sands of Morecambe Bay could be, how terrifying the tides. God forbid she was going to go and do something crazy. Albert began to run. He didn't really care about the woman. He didn't know her, after all. But he'd been following her all day, and somebody was bound to have noticed. 
the bus driver for one. A moment later, however, she vanished from sight. Albert was now slogging through sand so waterlogged it was more like sludge. The freezing wind was lashing him. It took him several minutes to make it to the dunes, where her trail snaked off through higher, drier sand and tussocks of spiky grass. It led over a steep brow, then down through a shallow gully to flat ground again. The sea was waiting there. A high tide was due and cold grey waves were already flowing far inland, breaking in front of him in wide ripples. Albert came down to the water's edge breathless, and perhaps 40 yards to his left saw the woman standing staring out over it. He approached her tentatively. She'd taken off her cowl and sunglasses and her bronzed hair was tossing wildly in the stiff breeze. She was rigid as a bald and made no indication that she knew he was there. As he closed in, however, the wind suddenly dropped and a handsome, flawless profile was presented to him. The petite chin tilted bravely upwards. Albert's jaw dropped. He saw the woman only from her right-hand side, but he'd have recognised her anywhere. How could he not have done? Christ almighty, he stammered. Angela. He stumbled disbelievingly towards her. At first, the flaxen blonde, who was now a garish, phony redhead, made no move. Then slowly she turned and looked directly at him. He stopped in his tracks, a cry of anguish locked in his throat. The full horror of it lasted only a second, however, before he realised that men were coming down from the sand dunes behind him. He didn't need to see them to know what they'd be like. Massive, hard-faced, dressed in casual but expensive suits. Thick gold rings on every finger. I'm sorry, Albert, she said after a second. As you can see, I had no choice. And then the men were on him, hacking bone-hard punches into his ribs. Are you serious? One of them hissed savagely into his ear. He repay Mr. Southern's generosity by falling around with his bit of carpet. Another man stood beside Angela, nonchalantly offering her a cigarette. She took it, but continued to watch, shivering as the rest of them hoisted up Albert's struggling, kicking body and carried it away towards the quicksand. A succession of tears made a single lonely trail down her right-hand cheek. Eastland, read by Joss Ackland. Derek had made sure he'd emptied his pipe before he went into the filing room. Personally, he didn't believe that the smoke would damage the thousands of ancient prints stored in there. But the photo librarian enjoyed a good moan, and the more petty the reason, the better she liked it. Still, mustn't grumble, Derek thought, as he began to work his way through the first filing cabinet. He hadn't grumbled in 35 years of working here. Why start now? The thought of his long years of service on the paper reminded him of how close to retirement he was and gave him a nice, warm feeling inside. It was why he liked junking stock. Apart from the fact that it was exclusively a midweek evening job, therefore all on overtime, which was a rare treat indeed on a local rag. It also gave him the opportunity to look over some of the pictures he'd taken as a whippersnapper. Light hadn't been shed on some of these since their original date of publication. Nostalgia was certainly all right by Derek. He began working his way forward from 1962. It would be the usual three-year scan. His brief was simple. Anything too yellowed or dog-eared to be of further use could go in the bin. Anything no longer relevant, any faces which had changed too much over the years, any landscapes no longer recognisable due to building or demolition could go in the bin. Any events which had never really been relevant, like check presentations, kiddies' parties, galas, carnivals, especially those full of guys with beetles' haircuts and women wearing beehives, could also go in the bin. Then Derek found one of his own. He remembered it vividly. How could he not have done? 
It was the murder of Lucy Renox back in March 62. A young schoolgirl she'd been, found at the north end of Candlewood Park, battered and strangled. As far as Derek knew, the killer had never been brought to justice. He himself had only been a rookie at the time. But it wasn't a bad shot for all that. The grainy black-and-white image showed perhaps twenty plainclothes policemen, most of them in those old-fashioned trench coats, standing in a tight group on an open grassy area. They were contemplating some huddled shape lying at their feet. These days, nowhere near as many officers would be tolerated on the murder scene. Uniformed constables were surrounding them in a wide cordon, holding back the onlookers. Then Derek had to blink and look twice at the old photograph. In the far background, a thickly wooded slope rose up to a high concrete wall surmounted with iron railings. Behind that stood the great black brick mass of the gasworks, now long gone. But below it, almost hidden in the trees, Derek could distinctly see the figure of a man. He was standing on the hill in a rigid posture, legs apart and hands by his sides. What was more, he seemed to be covered all over in black. Derek was amazed. He never remembered seeing that figure before. It was gazing down on the police officers in front of it, apparently absorbed in what it was seeing. But no, no, it wasn't gazing down at the police. It was actually gazing over them. At the photographer, in fact. At Derek. And now, of course, it was still gazing at him, over the gulf of thirty-three years. Derek shuddered and tossed it onto the filing cabinet, but he couldn't take his eyes off it. There was something rather horrible about that distant, sketchy figure. It wasn't just the fact that he had never seen it before, but the way it was standing, the way it had been fixing on him personally, trying to pin him down with its threatening stare. For a mad moment, Derek wondered if it had been the murderer, returning to the scene of the crime and inadvertently being caught on film, all those years ago, and yet nobody had ever noticed. It was an ugly thought, and as he went on leafing through the various envelopes of pictures, he tried to put it firmly to the back of his mind. The evening was drawing down and threatening rain when Nick climbed out of his car in the street adjoining Candlewood Park. He looked at the darkening rain-filled sky and swore quietly to himself before pulling the collar of his back up and getting his camera bag off the passenger seat. He supposed that as junior snapper it would always fall to him to do boring jobs like this at times of the day when everyone else was at home having their tea or putting their feet up in front of the telly. Still, it could be worse. Imagine being stuck back in the filing room like Derek, having to junk stock. It just went to show there could always be something worse around the next corner. And with that cheery thought, he went off into the park. Try as he may, Derek could not forget the mysterious figure, because now something else was starting to worry him. Hadn't there been another unsolved murder in Candlewood Park a few years later? Eventually, it began to irritate him so much that he realized he would have to stop what he was doing and have a look. As far as he knew, some drunken man had been beaten and throttled in the park some rainy Saturday night. All right, the method of execution had been similar, but no links had ever been made with the previous killing because everyone had assumed that the young girl's death was part of a sex attack. This later incident had been thought a sequel to some violent, drunken incident in one of the pubs earlier on in the evening. The trouble was, he couldn't remember exactly when it had happened. Eventually, after searching rather aimlessly through several randomly chosen envelopes, he moved across the tiny room to another row of cabinets. These were distinctly not to be touched during stock junking and were marked up alphabetically. He looked under M and quickly found his way to murder. 
As he'd expected, the envelope wasn't particularly full, and the first two prints he pulled out were the ones he sought. The date was July 1973. The location was Candlewood Park. The exact same area of Candlewood Park, give or take a few yards. Derek stared in disbelief at the photograph. The murder was now being dealt with more professionally. The area, which by then had become a playground, widely taped off, with only one or two detectives in the middle. But behind them, on the wooded rise now framed against a pale sky, the gasworks and its surrounding wall and railings having been removed, stood the same black-clad figure. As before, it peered down at the cameraman. This particular picture was not Derek's, but he felt the same cutting chill as the weird figure stared out at him through the ages. Nick was at the north end of the park before he found the spot the photographic manager wanted. Apparently, Editorial had requested some basic landscape shots of the playground area, in particular, views of the wooded slope leading up to where the old gasworks had once been. They were doing another of these then-and-now features, and were after as many good comparisons as possible. This was renowned as one of the most outstanding. The gasworks had been a dominating feature on the town skyline since the turn of the century, and many old-timers still referred to this part of the park as the gasworks' end. Nick didn't remember it, of course, or even care. He stood for a moment or so looking around him. It certainly couldn't have been this pretty in those days. Flower beds had been planted around the playground and bright new equipment installed for the kiddies. Safe equipment for a change. Mind you, it was still fairly gloomy. It had already rained once that evening, so the grassed areas were flooded and the tarmac walkways still puddled. There was an unseasonably chill wind blowing too. No wonder the place was empty. Nick mused on things for a moment, then decided to go for a wide landscape shot first. The best place seemed to be the wooded slope itself, just under where the gasworks wall had once been. If he could hack his way through all that dense summer undergrowth, he might be able to get something really panoramic. Camera bag on his back, he set off. Derek had moved out through the deserted office to the tea table, and with shaking hands had made himself a cuppa. He sat alone at the photographic desk, drinking it. It seemed absurd, but he was now absolutely convinced that they had caught the Candlewood Park Strangler on film, not once, but twice. What other explanation was there? The same man had been present at both murders, in exactly the same place and posture, at exactly the same time. The more Derek thought of it, the more remiss it seemed to the police not to at least have considered that the slayings might have been linked. He brushed back his thinning hair, and wondered if it was worth taking his theories down to the police station right now. All right, the last murder was over twenty years ago, but the cases must still be open. Would they not just laugh at him out of the station, though? Or maybe humour him, then call him a doddering old fool the moment his back was turned? After all, suppose it had been the killer. How old would he be by now? In his mid-fifties, at least. Well, that wasn't too old to be sent to prison. It wasn't even too old to commit murder again. He walked about the office for a few minutes. There had to be a perfectly logical explanation. But if there was, he couldn't think of it. Irritably, he went back into the filing room and put both pictures together. It was, without doubt, the same man, standing just inside the cover of the trees, obviously watching the police, but perhaps just looking up and realising, maybe with horror and rage, that he had been caught on film. Derek began to sweat. He had just begun to wonder what danger he himself might have been in way back in 1962. Even from this range, he could see how tall and well-built the man was, how solid he looked, and those jet-black clothes from head to foot. Folk today wore some pretty odd gear, but back in those days this would have been very unusual. Derek began to cast his mind back to other serial killers in recent British history. 
he remembered at least one who dressed all in black leathers and worn a terrifying zip-up mask. He looked back at the figure in the trees. Without a doubt, that man was covered in dark leather, head and hands included. Derek made a decision. He had to tell someone. All right, if they laughed at him, so what? At least he had discharged his duty. At least it wouldn't be on his conscience, even if he was the one who had accidentally withheld the evidence for three decades. That thought stopped him in his tracks, but he shrugged it off and went out into the office to put his coat on. To do nothing now would be even worse. It would be knowingly hiding evidence. That might even be construed a crime itself. First, he had to let someone know where he'd be, so he opened up the photographic diary to leave a message for young Nick, who was due back around eight. That is when Derek first noticed where Nick's main evening job had taken him to. His mouth froze open in a gaping hole. For a second, he was paralyzed with shock. Then he began to stumble toward the fire exit. Coincidence, it could not be. It could not. As he staggered across the car park, fumbling for his keys, he knew, he just knew, that his finding of the picture had been some kind of warning, some kind of vision. Something supernatural. Yes, he told himself, supernatural. Because supernatural was surely what the thing in the pictures was. That was no ordinary man, to have been there in just the right place at just the right time, on separate occasions eleven years apart. And no ordinary man could have done those diabolical things. As Derek gunned his little maestro out of the works car park, he knew that he wasn't thinking straight, that he had to get his jumble of thoughts in order. But Nick, young Nick, there on his own, in that terrible place of tragedy, he had to get to him first. Had to. Had to. Had to. He drove in a sweat, in a blind fury of tunnel vision, so much so that he never even saw the giant Arctic come sweeping out of the next factory yard. Never even noticed it until it smashed full steam into his little car, turning it instantly to a ball of flame and mangled metal, flipping it clean over the wall opposite, down into the railway cutting, where in that same second, a diesel express ploughed through it at over a hundred miles an hour, practically vaporizing it. Nick stood looking at the figure in the darkening park. He wondered how long it had been there, half hidden in the dense undergrowth. It was certainly a horrible thing. Years of rain, wind and ice had twisted and corroded it, leaving a black, featureless mannequin that was now more rust than cast iron. He had come upon it by accident, and given himself quite a fright, but now he thought he knew where it had come from. Donkeys years ago, apparently, the statue commemorating the Boer War had been removed from its plinth at the other end of the park. It had just vanished overnight. Nobody knew what had happened to it. It was long before his time, of course, but everyone had heard the story. Clearly the vandals had found it too heavy to carry away and dumped it here. Nick turned and looked back over the empty playground. It seemed hard to believe that it could have been standing out here undiscovered, so close to everybody, for thirty-odd years or more. <laughs> he chuckled. There was nothing so strange as folk. How often they miss things that were right under their noses. Then a hand grabbed the back of his neck. It had a grip like iron. Carter's First Case by Charles Coldwell Read by Roger Daltrey Carter Battersby was perplexed. Three short weeks earlier, he'd been sent for an interview by the Job Centre. 
Having filled in private investigator detection and undercover work as absolutely the only jobs he was prepared to accept, he'd expected to have several trouble-free years sponging off the state before being forced to accept employment again. He had not enjoyed working for the Refuse Disposal Department's transport office, and the feeling was definitely mutual. His irritation that an opening with Percy Tucker Investigations, confidentiality guaranteed, had appeared, was magnified when he was offered the job. The ailing Percy was desperate and had not warned to the other applicant, a police officer who had taken early retirement after too many confessions had been found to emanate from bruised prisoners. The last three weeks had been eventful and, to Carter's surprise, quite interesting. He had followed an erring husband for ten days and obtained photographic evidence of his alfresco activities with a strapping fitness instructor of uncertain gender. He was also currently staking out an allotment to trap a nocturnal Dahlia nobbler. It was all quite painless and enjoyable until Percy succumbed to his third heart attack. His widow, Dorothy, implored Carter to carry on the business, as she had no other means of support. The bread and butter work was regular and undeniably sufficient to support them both, and she was prepared to give him 60% of both the profits and the capital value of the premises, and goodwill. Carter was unable to resist the plight of Dorothy Tucker, or the romantic vision of himself as the 23-year-old sleuth, protector of widows and denizen of the twilight world of crime. But now he had a proper case and didn't know where to begin. His partner, the widow Dorothy, had phoned to ask him to go post-haste to the home of a friend, who was prepared to pay handsomely for a very swift resolution to a confidential domestic problem. The Ponderosa was a spectacular example of the pseudo-hacienda style of architecture favoured by those blessed with a great deal more money than taste. You're a bit young, aren't you, love? said Trish Potter. Well, I, uh, never mind. Dottie says you know what you're on about. And old Percy, God rest his soul, wouldn't have taken you on if you didn't, would he, eh? Trish Potter hitched the pink housecoat together over her ample brown, freckled bosom and continued. It's a matter of life and death, Carter. You don't mind if I call you Carter, do you? No, that's fine. I, uh, only I feel funny calling a young chap like you Mr Battersby. You see, Carter, it's a very delicate matter and I need your absolute discretion. My burner would do his nut and I dare tell the police because I don't know whether it's, well, you know, on the level with a tax and a VAT, if you know what I mean. She paused expectantly. Er, uh, no, I'm afraid I don't, Mrs Potter. What is it you daren't call the police about, exactly? My coat, love. My lovely Russian sable. Didn't Dotty tell you? It's gone. I was only out for half an hour. You'll go, eh? What's it? I left the bedroom window open and I noticed when I came back, ran upstairs to check and it was gone. He's always on about security and alarms, but I was only going round the corner to the chemist for my tranquilizers. You can help me, can't you? Her fingers dug into his upper arm so hard that he yelped. Yes, of course, Mrs Potter. Just leave it to me. I'll do anything to get that coat back before tonight, Carter. Anything. Name your price. Well, I charge expenses, obviously, plus an hourly rate of... I'll give you 500 in cash, Carter, if that coat is back in my closet before Bernard comes home tonight. Carter started by examining the window. Having examined it for a good five minutes, from inside and out, he felt that nothing more was to be gained by staring blankly at a very ordinary window, which bore no telltale shreds of clothing or bloodstains, no train ticket or wallet lodged in the bushes below, no footprint in the soft earth, no marks of a ladder. It seemed to Carter's very inexpert eye that no one had entered through that window. Yet the coat was certainly not in the cupboard, as the very empty silk padded hanger bore testimony. What on earth now? Asked the neighbours. You never know, he thought, suppressing the leaden certainty that he did, in fact, know very well. I'll just have a word with some of your neighbours and ask if they saw anyone suspicious hanging around this morning, and, uh, well, we'll take it from there. 
he explained as he headed out of the studded oak effect front door. Quite what he would do if the neighbours had noticed anything, he didn't know. Eight suspicious neighbours later, Carter was no closer to anything resembling a lead. What would Peter Whimsy do now? Or Sam Spade? He mused gloomily as he sat in his car and watched a black limo glide up to the gates of the Ponderosa's long drive. The only occupant, a uniformed chauffeur, glanced up and down the street, sidled into the drive and emerged seconds later with a black plastic bin bag, which he placed on the front seat of the car before speeding off. Oh, yes, thought Carter, as he fired the engine of the firm's Fiat Uno. It must be. I can see it all. A gentleman cracksman, dressed from head to foot in black, must have slipped in and out of the Ponderosa, leaving no trace, and stashed the loot for his accomplice, who must have been his Batman in the army, to collect at leisure when the heat was off. Yes! Carter had never tailed anyone before. For the first time since he had inherited the Uno along with the business, he was grateful that the vehicle was so nondescript. It was surprisingly easy despite the odd worrying moment when vehicles slipped in between them at roundabouts and intersections. If Carter had been a little more experienced in his new profession, it is probable that he would not have followed the limo right into the car park at the back of the trading estate. But if the chauffeur had registered his presence, he gave no indication. A thick-set grey-haired man in a shiny suit bustled down the fire escape at the back of the building and was handed the black plastic sack. He opened it and immediately hurled it on the ground in rage. The bag burst open, spilling its messy contents over the asphalt. Shiny, then vigorously berated Uniform, whose body language gave every indication of the aggrieved innocence of a minion doing his best in difficult circumstances. Then they both got back into the car which swung out of the car park in the direction Carter suspected of the Ponderosa. Carter's first piece of real detection was a mixture of intuition and pure luck. Instead of sticking close to his only lead, he gambled on a hunch and headed for the waste disposal site at Barley Hill. Twenty minutes later, he was standing, as his mother would say, like piffy on a monument, on a mountain of black plastic bags. A quick word with the site foreman had led him to the eastern edge of the landfill site and a promise of no further waste tipping that afternoon. Forty-five minutes after that, he was holding a coat which would have reduced the anti-fur lobbyist to apoplexy. As the grin of triumph spread across his face, he heard a voice bellowing from behind him. Before you get any big ideas, son, that's my property you've got there. Go and get it, Harry. As Harry the chauffeur advanced towards him purposefully, Carter decided to play the only card he had. I'm afraid you're mistaken, gentlemen. I'm a private investigator and this coat is the property of my client. I must ask you to let me pass or I shall be obliged to take the matter further, he finished lamely. I don't care if you're Sherlock bloody Holmes, lad. It's mine and you'll get a sound smacking if you don't hand it over pronto. Better do what Mr Potter says, son, offered Harry. He doesn't make idle threats. Mr Potter? Oh no, started Carter. Shut your stupid mouth, Harry. No names, no patry away, shouted the now firmly identified Bernard Potter. Is Trish Potter your wife? Eh? What's that got to do with you? Well, what's, what's going on here? Just what the hell are you doing with that coat? And how did you know it belonged to my wife? Carter had no option but to explain his mission. Obviously, Potter knew of the coat's absence from its proper place at the Ponderosa, so there was no way to protect his client. He decided to come clean and hoped to avoid at least the promised smacking, which, looking at the two men facing him, he had no reason to doubt would be comprehensive and efficient. They listened carefully to his story. There was a long pause as Bernard Potter pursed his lips thoughtfully and gave a low whistle. Right, son, what you will do is this. A little while later, 
Carter was explaining to his client that he had found a couple of very strong leads and was confident that he could recover the coat within three days at the most. Well, son, as it turns out, replied Trish, now dressed in a peach-coloured trouser suit with embroidered panda motifs. That may be hunky-dory. Bernard's just phoned. He's away on business till the weekend. Just as long as it's back before then... Oh, I'll be so grateful, dear Carter. Bernard Potter had cash flow problems. He needed £30,000 in cash urgently and the coat could raise it painlessly and swiftly, with the promise of similarly swift and painless redemption if the deal went through satisfactorily a few days later. He had stashed the coat in a bin bag by the gate for Harry to collect. However, the refuse collection had been a day early because of the impending bank holiday at the weekend and Harry had picked up a bag of fresh rubbish taken out later by the cleaner. Carter's brief sojourn with the Waste Disposal Department had not only provided him with the knowledge of the early collection, but had led him to the right tip at the right place, ahead of Potter and before the precious coat had been buried under tons of waste. Bernard handed over the coat to Carter three days later, and having done extremely well on his unspecified and probably best forgotten deal, pressed £500 into his hand with a conspiratorial wink. The grateful Trish, who brushed aside Carter's modest mutterings about routine procedures and all in a day's work, gave him the promised £500 fee plus a bonus of £100 for expenses, despite his protestations about £5 for petrol being enough. Well, thought Carter, as he adopted a nonchalant pose in front of the office mirror, at least it will keep me going until that mysterious leggy blonde with the black veil staggers in and faints in my arms. Meanwhile, back to the Dahlia Wars.